So we'll, 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 we'll continue. So this is the second part of our uh, very casual um, event. Uh, my name is Zhang Bo. Uh, this is David Baker, Dr. Baker. We met um, during this research. David is um, um, professor at, uh, assistant professor at Hong Kong University, the Swire Institute of uh, Marine Science. And when I visited you, I saw the jellyfish uh, and algae in a symbiotic relationship. And um, I learned that you mainly work on um, biodiversity, conservation, jellyfish, algae, and uh, coral. Right. Yeah. So I'm really grateful that you're here having this conversation um, because I think there a lot is happening um, to, to learn about what knowledge has been practiced by living beings for you know, millions of years that we stopped thinking about these issues. Now we only think about human knowledge practice. Um, but before we get into the, before we get into the uh, discussion, uh, I will just mention three people. So this is Oscar, who's the uh, Asia Archives uh, public program lead. So she's been tremendously helpful for my residency here. And Michelle is there. Michelle is a researcher. Uh, she's also in charge of the Habi Chan Archive in Fortan. Um, so we visited the, arc, uh, the, the collection. And this residency is actually f part of the Habi Chan Archive project, also funded by the Jockey Club. And also we have Michael here, Michael Lang, many of you know. He's an urban farmer, designer. Um, uh, he's also teaching and also doing research. So we'll, we'll invite them to join, and Michael will also share some ideas. Um, but before that, I actually want to show some of the pr primers. So I just pull these things out. Um, because I think many of people here are probably related to the art field, not from the science field. So in case you didn't take this in high school where you don't remember, just refresh your memory. Okay. So, th so these are DNA uh, structure. And then, you know, there are four codes, T, A, C, G. They pair up. Uh, so we have this helix structure. So these are called uh, nuclear tide base pairs. Okay. So far, so I good. Right. Okay. So that's how our DNA um, is constructed. Um, so this is the textual information I just mentioned. So these things live in our human cells or other animal cells too, or plant cells too. And plants and, and, plants and algae. And algae and bacteria. And bacteria, yeah. except bacteria don't have a nucleus. Right. So this one is just showing the nucleus. So these are the DNA in there, kind of like spaghetti there. And we have three billion pairs of the uh, nuclear uh, bases. Um, so they reside in 23 cr chromosomes. The 23 we usually know, but we actually, most people don't really know that we have three billion base pairs. So some people have, so I mean, like before I get into this, so, so you just imagine we have trillions of cells, right? in our human body, and each cell has the nucleus, and each nucleus has three billion base pairs. So basically, our living body is just this huge, you know, three billion times trillions of cells of information, right? Every, everyone here is this huge amount of data right, sitting here. And I, I also learned, I hope it's true, that the cell can duplicate in a few hours. So basically we can copy three billion pairs in a few hours. That's what we're doing as we're sitting here. So we're just replicating this huge amount of information as we're just living. And so some people are working on this idea of writing information into DNA. So we can take the files, you know, like photo, music, whatever, PDF, and then we usually code it now in binary code and because DNA has four codes, so we can actually translate this into the four codes and then write it as DNA. And when we want to access that file, we will sequence the DNA, decode it, and then get the file so we can listen to music. Right. So this is the, this is actual happening. Right. 
So there are companies doing this already. It just ex it's too expensive. But this is how we store information right now. Uh, anyone have? So this is a server farm. Anyone knows about this picture? So so you can see the corner. It's copyright Facebook. So this is P Facebook's server farm. Um, so you have these huge fans to cool the servers down. So OR, I mean not you know because they have multiple server farms. So this one is uh, outside the U.S. So possibly you know some of our files are actually stored there. Right. So this is a facility. That's how it looks like. And this is from an article in 2016 from the Daily Mail. It says, that's really cool. Facebook gives a rare glimpse inside its gigantic Lulea server farm just 70 miles from the Arctic. Okay. So this is where the, 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 the pictures I just show you is. Okay. So you know, just to make it tangible, AAA probably stores data in some server farm. In Singapore, right? Do you use Amazon? No. Do you know? Can you tell? That's beyond me. Okay, <laughs> right, right. So, so it, 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 you know, it's 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 physical. You know, we often think it's it's just you know it's somewhere abstract, but it's it's always physical, right? Like AA, when we go to a website to search, we're accessing the server in Singapore. Right? Right. So this is how the 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 servers look, and if they break down, you know, that actual person swaps them out. And then Facebook assures us they destroy the, ser the drives, so our data will be protected. So they don't reuse the, <laughs> they don't reuse the drives. So this is the actual picture from Facebook. It's also copyrighted by Facebook. Right. So that's how, uh, just to start there. You have this, so you can talk about this. Right. Okay, so I'll give it to you. Okay. You have more. You have more advanced things to talk. Yeah. About. Well, we can talk and look at pictures. Well, I hope we can replicate our conversation from the other day because <laughs> I thought that was really fascinating. I mean, I'm a scientist, and um, you know, we have a very sort of objective way of looking at the world, right. and um, and so you know, our our brains are not always tuned to the artistic side of humanity. Um, so I think having a discussion with you was really, really mind-opening, you know, to think about how we store information and what we can learn from nature. And um, so as Bo correctly pointed out, we're all just walking archives. And I mean, some evolutionary biologists believe that we are just vehicles for this information, right? So we're just machines that's constructed because of this blueprint and, um, and our sole existence is to make sure that, that information is propagated into the future. Um, and I think that's really remarkable. And this is what it looks like. So th these are, this is your, your library. We all have this library. Um, this, of course, is a female with t two X chromosomes, the sex chromosomes. Um, but you can visualize this. You can see your own library. Um, all that information, highly condensed, uh, very well curated, edited constantly. Um, it's remarkable to see this. I mean, this and this is in all of our really secondary school textbooks. But I think we don't really appreciate the gravity of how remarkable this is. Um, and as you were just told, it's a heck of a lot of information. Um, if you if you just took one copy of our whole genome, and you wrote it out by hand. Well, it says it would take a typist working eight hours a day, half a century to type, and it would fill a million pages, or 5,000 books stacked 200 feet high. So that's a heck of a lot of information. So it's literally an entire library. And then you consider that each of our cells contains two copies of that library, right? Each strand of DNA is redundant, right? Because each, each strand has all the information. It's complementary. Um, there's a, an incredible amount of redundancy, so that information is so important that it's copied multiple times in multiple ways and stored. And, and our cells go through great effort to, to maintain that storage. So as you pointed out already, uh, DNA is digital. So it's a, it's a step beyond the binary code that we use in all, most of our technologies. 
with those four possible values, and in fact, there's more than four. Um, and a lot of the cutting edge of, of genetics research is looking at how we can modify DNA. Uh, yeah, that's I've read an article saying if they can expand it beyond four, so you can encode even more information. That's right, yeah. There are a few other nucleotides that are involved, especially in RNA s synthesis, how we, how we translate DNA into protein. Um, and also there's this emergent field called epigenetics, where we talk about how DNA can be modified uh, through a process called methylation. So just imagine if we just tagged our nucleotides with these little modifiers, and those modifiers change how the DNA is expressed. Um, and this is really hot stuff because it, it, it provides a mechanism for how the environment can modify our library. It can, it can perhaps assist with rapid adaptation to environmental change. So is it, is it similar to saying, you know, I get, a, I get a book from a library, but through these modifiers, the story I read is a different version from yeah, or, without Yeah, or like a, a new edition, it's I guess. It's a new edition. Yeah, okay. a new edition, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes those modifications are minor. Um, sometimes they're adaptive, so they help you in some way, and sometimes they're maladaptive. So we, we tend to lose these adaptations as we age, these modifications as we age. And uh, so I, I actually, I, I went to the UK consulate a couple of weeks ago because I'm involved in some forensics work. And they have this remarkable technology where they can take a person's fingerprint, you know, the oils and residues left behind, they can get their full genome out of the fingerprint. And then they can, they can sequence it, and they can look at the methylation pattern, so they can tell you the age of the person that left behind that fingerprint. And they can also tell what their eye color is, what their ethnicity is, all just by reading that library, to the best of our knowledge. So the technology is getting really scary, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the cool part is, is that it's all self-correcting. You know, so we think about information, and it's the ability for it to be corrupted. You know, in fact, I think books are at probably a pretty reliable. good, reliable way of storing information because you have a physical copy, and as long as it's not damaged by water or fire or whatever, it, it, it will stand the test of time. How does a self-correcting work? I mean, if, just if you can explain. Well, because the DNA strand is redundant, right? So these nucleotides are paired. They're complementary. So if we open up the DNA strand, each strand can be copied, right? And the other one can always be used to cross-reference the other, right? So we can always double-check that, that any copying of the DNA is correct. So there's a certain enzyme, a, the, a DNA polymerase. So they do the checking? They do the checking. Okay. Yeah, it's self-editing. So after, as the DNA is being copied, there's another enzyme that kind of trucks along. These things like, it looks like, you can watch YouTube videos on how this works. It looks like little, like a train set, you know. These little enzymes jump along the, the DNA strand. And one of them is actually physically connecting the nucleotides together to copy the DNA. This is before your cells would divide. And then the second uh, enzyme's coming along, and it's just making sure that everything's correct. And if, it's, if it finds an error, a mismatch between the two strands, it will go in and it will replace the one that's incorrect. It's remarkable. And that self-correcting uh, mechanism ensures that there is fewer than one error per 10 billion base pairs. So imagine if you had that in Microsoft three, Windows or three, something. We have three, right. We have three billion base pairs. Three billion. Right. Yeah. So usually you're saying one out of 10 billion. So yeah. it's, it's and that's really important, right? right? Because if you have an error, then you can get cancer, right? right? Well um, it still happens, right? It still happens. Right. And that's why you know things, genetic t diseases like cancer um, often that's why they propagate as you get older, because the probability of you having an error every time your cells divide increases through time. Yeah. But still, pretty good system. And yeah, you showed this incredible, this was from a 2012 article, right? 2016. 2016, yeah. okay. Um, comparing the storage potential of DNA. Um, so it's incredibly fast, and if you think about this, it has to be, right? I mean, when you burn yourself, your cells immediately start a healing process, right? Um, so wound healing is something that we can think of where the, the, the action of our DNA has to be instantaneous. Uh, we know that D DNA can be preserved for 
hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? I mean, th this one says more than a hundred, but you know, like other people say, you know, archaeologists, they can get DNA, you know, for 20,000 years or even yeah, more, sure. right? Yeah. I mean, Jurassic Park is not science fiction anymore. You know, we have a whole genome of a woolly mammoth <laughs> that was frozen in, in the ice, you know? So the DNA is remarkably preserved. Right. Um, Almost no power usage. Yeah, so this one actually was really, I mean, like for me, this one is incredible. Mm. Like it's just the, the, the watts per gigabyte. The flash drive takes 0 0.01 watts per gigabyte, mm -hmm. but this one is like 10 to the negative 10. Yeah, it's that's like just functionally zero. Incredibly yeah. <laughs> beyond my imagination. It's just yeah. the, the small bit of energy for the chemical reactions. But it's, it's so low because it's chemical based, not uh, magnetic. Based? Yeah, is that it's what? all chemistry, biochemistry. Because and it's flash drive is magnetic right. based, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So you're saying that the chemistry uses a lot lower energy. Yeah, and it's all optimized to our average temperatures, you know. Ev that, that biochemistry is honed over right. the entirety of the evolution of life. Right. So it's incredibly efficient because if it wasn't, we would never have enough energy to reproduce. Yeah, also the number I, I read is like for, for my body to live, if I'm not doing like computer stuff, I'm just living, it takes like 60 watts. Mm -hmm. So just a few bulbs to keep, you know, trillions of cells yeah. alive. Yeah. yeah. So that's why they're saying, uh, the, the most remarkable statistic here is that if you had a kilogram of DNA, you could store all of the world's knowledge in a one kilo. So that's why people are really thinking about this as, as one of the future um, so quantum leaps so in, in computing. So AA will be like this much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So everyone can get a copy after this talk. <laughs> right. um, so yeah, so the size of a genome is, is really variable across the domains of life. Um, viruses and bacteria are really efficient because they, well, they can't afford to carry around a whole lot of baggage. They're tiny entities and um, so you find that most of their genome is, a f is functional. It's it, the, g the DNA is coding for something that is useful to them. But then when you go into these higher forms of life, which we call the metazoans, um, you'll see that the genome size gets much, much bigger. And that's because we have what we still call junk DNA. Right. But it's, it, just, it might just be we don't know. I, I right. think it's most likely that we just don't know what right. it's doing, yeah. But we have all this DNA that scientists don't know what it does. It doesn't seem to actually be um, functional in a sense that it's coding for a, you know, the production of a protein or whatever. Um, I'm sure that in five to 10 years, we'll learn that that's all wrong um, and that it's actually very important. Uh, one thing that I often think about is, is uh, disease. So a lot of uh, viruses um, attack our DNA. They insert their, their genetic code into our own which is really scary. Um, and then when our cells are trying to um, function, we can make more copies of the virus in the, in that, in the process. Um, that's why what makes viruses very effective pathogens. Um, but we also harness that capability in biotechnology because we can use viruses to insert pieces of DNA that we'd like to have in our genome, right? Um, so that's the foundation of genetic engineering. But the so I just want to point out the human genome is three, three, three billion base pairs, right. um, but the plant, the canopy plant has 150 billion base yeah. pairs. Why, why, why does a plant have more than human? Yeah, plants are remarkable because they can, they have undergone through evolutionary. So, so I mean, just, just to say, so, so they actually their cells contain more information. That's anyway, right, much, right, more. Right, much more. Much more. But a lot of it is that. again re redundancy right. and duplication. So. Plants have undergone what they call whole genome duplication. Um, and sometimes they've done that twice. So uh, w I, I'm not quite aware of what the reasons for that are. But imagine they've just doubled or tripled their entire genome, but it's redundant. It's three copies of the same thing. Um, still, even, even you know, let's say we have two copies, if they have four copies, mm -hmm. still it's bigger. Yes, right? much bigger. And also you mentioned the algae. The dinoflagellite. Some yeah. of the algae. Oh, so maybe yeah, I'm getting yeah. to it. Right, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, these guys. So these are cells that are near and dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> these are the dinoflagellates. How big are they? 
Um, well, they can range in size by quite a lot, but uh, the ones I work with are about 10, 10 to 20 microns in diameter. <laughs> what is a micron? A micron is a thousandth of a <laughs> millimeter. A, th a thousandth of a millimeter. A hair is about 50 microns in width. Yeah, so these guys are about, yeah, uh, a fifth of the width of your hair. Small, they're very small. But they're remarkable, and you can see these shapes. Actually, for those art natural history art fanatics, uh, Ernst Haeckel, yes. who was a fantastic uh, um, biological illustrator, has a whole series of these um, that are hand-drawn, really, really beautiful. Uh, how did so he had a micro. Uh, he had a microscope. Yeah. To mm -hmm. draw. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can you can. I was looking at this before when I was putting this together, and you can now like, you can buy pillowcases with dinoflagellates or Haeckel's drawings <laughs> on your pillow or your curtains or wallpaper. You can you know it's it's very trendy right now. <laughs> um, but when I look at these things, I feel actually a little bit of sense of a fear because they're they're very alien, yes. you know. And these are very very ancient organisms. They've been around for. 250 million years. We've only been around for probably a hundred thousand years, so they're very, very old. And you know, they look alien. They're capable of. They're capable of using their immense genetic information to transform themselves. You said uh, the 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 article you point out. They the the base pair could be 250 GB. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I have so that too. You're al you're always uh, sorry. One step ahead. <laughs> sorry. <I'm not> <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, these these are good questions because they're helping me move along. Um, no, no, but we can go back. I'm sorry. No, I think this is this is probably the most nerdy figure you'll see. But um, this is the genome size for a, a wide diversity of these dinoflagellates, and so the ones that I study are way up here, and they have the smallest genomes of any dinoflagellates, but they're still much larger than the human genome. And the reason that their genomes are small is because they've reduced the size of their genome because they rely on something else to, um, to live their daily lives. So these are dinoflagellates that are found in corals, in some types of clams, in a variety of marine, marine life that has partnered with these essential their plant cells. And they can merge their animal and plant metabolisms to survive in really extreme environments. So they actively shed some DNA uh, when, yeah, they, when the they get into a symbiotic, stable symbiotic relationship. Right, and that is the hallmark of symbiosis, right? So when you become so reliant... So you always see this shedding of DNA. In, no, it's not a common okay. feature for all symbiotic associations. Okay. So even in our cells, we have mitochondria. And that's believed to be an ancient symbiosis. Where, and the mitochondria has its own genome but it's been reduced, 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 because it doesn't need all of those other functions that our cells do for them to maintain them. You had a question. Yeah, you just explain the name, dinoflagellate? Oh, wow, I, d I don't know. Uh, I don't know where the dino comes from, actually. Uh, but the flagellate is, is very easy. So you'll notice that they all have a belt. They have a groove that goes around the body. And in that groove, they, main they keep a flagella. And a flagella is a cellular structure that does this. <laughs> it's like a, you can think of it as a hair. It's actually a remarkable piece of bioengineering um, because it's a machine with no moving parts, right? Um, and so some of them use these flagella to swim, swim around the water column, or they use the flagella to you know, circulate nutrients around their bodies. Some of them have lost the flagella. Um, and they can grow it or lose it uh, whenever they like. Why do they have different shapes? <laughs> That's another great question. Um, sometimes it's for anti, uh, it's, a, it's a defensive mechanism. So if you see things like spikes, well obviously they're, they're going to be useful if someone's filter feeding, trying to eat you, um, to make you less palatable. Um, but otherwise I don't know what's, what drives a lot of the variation in, in these structures. I mean, it's, it's actually a sort of a theoretical question in humanities. People start to say whether they do have aesthetic agency. You know, mm. they don't. They don't just create their shape for functional purposes. You know, we we just we only think we can consider beauty, but maybe they do too. You know, but but what whatever. I mean, that that's always. Huh? Yeah, smooth, smooth body wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the. 
And these plates that they surround themselves with, it's made out of cellulose, just like a plant fiber, um, but really remarkable. Are, are going back to the, the size of their genome, you yeah. were saying the ones you study because they are in a symbi symbiotic relationship yeah. with corals, right. so they have a smaller genome. That's right. But there are the super big... Yeah, all ones. the way out here. These, right. So this one is the king of genomes uh, for any living organism. So we're pro approaching oh, really? so 300 billion base pairs. It's the largest genome of any eukaryotic organism. So any organism that has a nucleus in the cell, the uh -huh. biggest. So it's astonishing. And it's like, what are they doing with all that information? Do we know why? Or? Well, we can speculate. So I highlighted another one here mm -hmm. called Fisteria. Has anyone ever heard of Fisteria? If you, if you, I'm from the east coast of the United States, everyone knows what Fisteria is because it's um, a harmful al algae. And Fisteria, again, dinoflagellate, there's its little fl flagella around its belt, tucks down here so it can swim around. And I think when I was in college, ages ago, um, there was an outbreak of Fisteria in the Chesapeake Bay area and into Virginia, and uh, this dinoflagellate, for some reason, I mean, it's always been there. It's been there for millions and millions of years. But for some reason, uh, likely due to pollution, agricultural pollution and fish farming and all that kind of stuff that we do, um, it decided that it was time to switch on a different part of its genome. So it became a pathogen. And so uh, people noticed that fish were dying, large fish kills. They all had these strange lesions, which were from... Th these are algae, right? So I always thought algae don't attack other animals. No. Oh yeah, they can attack animals. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so this is the result of a fish. These are filter feeding fish, so they ate the cells and then the cells ate the fish from the inside out. So they became heterotrophic. And moreover, they s produce a neurotoxin. So the fishermen that were handling the fish would say, oh, this is very odd. And then they would go home and they would they would fall down because they've lost their balance. They would have trouble breathing. They would lose their vision. They were, these cells were producing incredible neur neurotoxin that was toxic to vertebrates like us. Um, so it was, it was terrifying. And it was on the news every single day. And people were panicking. And no one was eating fish. Um, and it's all because of this little guy. So massive genome. And what does that genome do? Well, it allows these cells to be incredibly flexible as the environment changes. So they can live in the sediment, they can live in the water. Each one of these images represents a different stage in its life cycle. So it has 32 different forms, right? So it's just like imagining if a human being could sprout wings and fly away or, you know, grow, grow limbs and run like a cheetah. Like that's what this organism is doing. It, that's the equivalent of what it's doing. Um, and if conditions are really bad, it turns into a cyst and just lies dormant in the sediment and waits for conditions to become better. Yeah, you also mentioned some of them actually pack their DNA into crystal. Yeah, I'll, I'll get back oh, to that too. Yeah, sorry, sorry. yeah. <laughs> you're you're really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, maybe maybe for that. So like, are they present in Hong Kong? Visteria. No. <laughs> that's that's a good question. Actually, I don't think so. But you know, there's really not much of a reason why it shouldn't be because many of these. Many of these um, marine algae are found globally. Um, they're globally distributed because the oceans are connected. Right. Uh, and if they're not connected, we're certainly, we're certainly spreading them around right. through the shipping industry. Yeah. Um, Hong Kong has its own consortium of harmful algae, right? We have them. In fact, you can download an app on your iPhone. The AFCD right. has the red tide monitoring uh -huh. app. Um, and especially in these times of year, the seasonal transitions, we get a lot of alg algal blooms. Um, and many of them are these dinoflagellates, and some of them are toxic to humans and to, and to fish as well. Okay. Yeah. So there's good reason to understand these organisms as much as we can. But the ones I work with are much friendlier. <laughs> yeah. So these little brown guys up there, these little balls, are uh, called symbiodinium. And their, their Latin name reflects the fact that they're symbiotic with so many marine organisms. And without them, we would not have coral reefs. Um, so they live inside the, the host animal, which is a coral. So this is a, an individual coral polyp, like a little jellyfish with its head stuck in a skeleton. 
and uh, many, many trillions of those polyps work together to create uh, the reef structure. And the, the dinoflagellate gives the coral the ability to create a foundation, the, this limestone skeleton that underpins this whole structure and collectively attracts so much incredible marine life. And what do they get in return, the dinoflagellate? Uh, they get a shelter, first okay. of all. Um, so inside the host, they're protected. The coral's skin is covered in little guns, just like a jellyfish. They have the ability to sting, and um, so it's somewhat defensive. And the host also provides them with nutrition. So the coral can eat things that swim by, and then the waste products from its digestion can be used to fertilize these little cells. So that combination, you have an animal and a plant that are living in an extreme environment because coral reefs are only found where the water is super, super clear. We actually call them marine, marine deserts. Um, plenty of water, but there's nothing to eat, right? And by combining forces, these, group, these organisms have been successful because the plant provides the food and the plant is just photosynthesizing from the sun. So it's a remarkable association. Of course, we all know that this association is falling apart. Uh, and that image shows coral bleaching, uh, which is happening on a mass scale globally. Also in Hong Kong, too? Uh, a little bit in Hong Kong, yeah. L um, but not as severe as we would predict. No mm -hmm. Probably because the water is sufficiently polluted Already, right? that, it, that it prevents the, the very strong light from triggering the bleaching response. Um, that's a very interesting hypothesis. So, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, how, how big is the genome for the coral? Oh, that's a really good question. It's smaller than this, their symbiont. Uh -huh. um, I, I don't know off the top okay. of my head. Yeah. Uh, but they have in, in the highly co-evolved partnerships. So we, they're corals that if you don't have the algae, they die. Right. Right. Because they need that library that complementary library. So in it, for example, um, there's one coral where we have a whole genome, and we know that that coral has, does not have the ability to synthesize an essential amino acid called cysteine. Um, and if you can't get an amino acid from your, by synthesizing it yourself, you have to get it from your diet. And these cells are, are amino acid factories. So that means that without that, and without any food they source, the they'll die. Yeah, they don't have the knowledge. Uh, I think I only have one more slide. Yeah, this so this is, oh, th this is, this is about one. the, the right. compression. Yeah, so um, this is a, just from a study that was a few years ago. And so using like really high-end um, uh, instrumentation, this is from a synchrotron, which is essentially like a, you've heard of the Large Hadron Collider, right? The CERN experiment. So these are particle accelerators. Um, smaller scale versions of them can be used to study microscopic structures in very high resolution. And this is the first image of the compressed genome of a dinoflagellate. And um, so their genomes are so complicated, so large, that they compress them into what's a considered a liquid crystal structure. And it, uh, this is a schematic of what it might look like. So it's multiple levels of compression um, so of our, our genome is the helix structure. We have a double helix, we and it's compressed helix. into a, a kind of a, relative to this, a loose So chromosome. it's also compressed. It's also compressed, yeah, okay. and wound around proteins, and then kind of, imagine if you take a rope and you twist, uh -huh. it, and twist it and twist it and twist it and twist it, and eventually it'll create this So every one of us has this thing. Yeah, it'll right. create a secondary structure. But okay. we don't go to the extent to of, the ex right. of forcing it into this sort of, well, it's like a quaternary structure, you know. Mm -hmm this uh, a totally different level of, of compression. And then can they still access the information? Do they, do they need to unpack it before they can? They do, and that's why for a lot of these cells, they don't like to have turbulence. So I, I culture them in my laboratory, and we keep them in very simple conditions. Uh, when you culture cells, like if I wanted to culture human cells, for example, usually you'll see the media as being sloshed around on a, on a plate or something, or spun. And that's because you want to maximize the exchange of nutrients with those cells. But these guys just like to sit there. And the reason is, is that they have these inside of them. So as, imagine if you had a water balloon, right. and you filled that water balloon with razor blades. 
right? So as long as it's stationary, right. it's, the okay. it's fine. But when you do this, so you're going to you have a problem. You destroy the information. Right. Sorry? If, if you shake it, you might destroy the information. Well, you might destroy right. the container for that information, right. yeah. Um, have I tried? Yeah, they just, they don't grow. They don't grow because they cannot decompress their DNA and copy it to make a new cell. Yeah. So, um, so now we grow them just in a static culture. Um, but this could be used for the DNA encoding, which will be even yeah, higher capacity. So for DNA computing, right. this gives you a whole other level of compression, compression. And, and storage and also durability. Um, I used to work at the Smithsonian um, Nat National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., and um, I was doing some, actually it's a bit of an interesting story. I was, I was working in the Bahamas at a marine station and there was no power there. And I was working at night in a laboratory and I, ha I had a headlamp, it was sweltering hot, I had to keep the doors open so I didn't suffocate and die. And I'm processing my coral samples to bring back to, to DC. And I got so angry, you know, because the conditions were so bad. <laughs> So I put some samples aside and I said, I'm going to dry, I dried them in an oven. And I said, I want to see if I can um, isolate these cells, these symbiont cells when I get back to Washington. I still had to complete the work while I was there. And when I got back to Washington, I did this, the cell separation in the laboratory and it worked like a dream. And in fact, I looked at the cells under the microscope and even after being dried, they looked at, like they were still alive even. They weren't alive, but they were in very good condition. And then this light bulb went off in my head. I think it was the only time I've ever had that feeling. <laughs> and uh, because the museum, the museum has thousands and thousands of specimens right. of corals and all kinds of marine invertebrates that were collected ever since the early 1800s, the very first um, ocean explorations. And so I had some of these m samples in my office and I ran there and I got some of that material. And then I quickly took it and extract, you know, did the cell separations and I, looked at them under the microscope and I saw, you know, they looked exactly like, um, oops, they looked exactly like these almost, except not, not as strongly pigmented. So at that time I knew nothing about, uh, I didn't have no practical skills in genetics. Um, so I found an, another scientist within the Smithsonian um, who ran a big molecular biology laboratory and I went down there immediately and I said, I need to know what these are. I want to know what their genetic identity is. And he laughed at me and he said, no way, it's never going to work. Um, and I, so I, I was trained to do the molecular biology by some of the lab technicians. And then the first time I, I sequenced uh, the DNA that I obtained, I, I got all the information I needed. So he was blown away. Mm -hmm. But it was very likely due to the fact that the DNA is, ha is so compressed and it's so resilient and so well s uh, stored that that my work was successful. And that was the first time that anyone had ever done any sort of, we call that ancient DNA, right. uh, looking into the past to... But now it's a big field. Yeah, it's a huge field now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. For human evolution in particular. Right. Yeah. So question on this, the, the symbiotic shedding of the DNA. Like, can you, do you have, like, can people actually demonstrate the DNA size, the, the genome size has shrunk as they get into the symbiotic relationship? Like, can you prove it or it's just a theory? Well, you can, when you study evolution, you can build these phylogenetic trees. Mm -hmm. So you can build a, it's a, essentially a family history mm -hmm. for any organism. And um, using um, mathematical tools, we can calculate the time at which uh, two, common a two organisms diverge from a common ancestor. So that, they call that a molecular clock. Mm -hmm. And um, so using that information, we can compare, say, groups of dinoflagellates that we know are symbiotic mm -hmm. with closely related relatives that are not symbiotic. Mm -hmm. And then we can back calculate what it was the approximate time that they diverged right. from one another from a common ancestor. Right. And that will help us to understand when the, when the emergence of symbiosis takes place. We think that the, model, the modern relationship between these dinoflagellates and corals goes back to the Triassic. Okay. And at that time, um, the, the relationship was immensely successful because they created what eventually became the Alps. Mm -hmm. So the mountains of the Alps are Quite carbonate, carbonate yeah. formations that were created by coral reefs. I also 
I think I also maybe you told me where maybe I read it from somewhere else. Like it, the the symbiotic relationship works when there's when they are kind of in a destitute situation. Mm. Uh, if there's two abundant resources, they don't cohabit. Is that's that true? Yeah, that's right. right. Um, so, yeah, lean times, mm -hmm. <laughs> lean times create unusual Marriages. partnerships. Yeah, yeah. and um, so we know that when conditions are extreme, symbiosis seems to emerge. And uh, the the most fascinating stuff comes from the human gut microbiome research that's ongoing now, and we know that. For example, indigenous tribes that live in um, extreme areas, like mm -hmm. in, in the Amazon rainforest, mm -hmm. their gut um, microbiota is so much more diverse than what 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 we have, what we have in in modern societies and, or right. people that have, say, a Western style diet. And it's because these people are eating different things on a daily basis, and they're also ingesting a lot of environmental microbes from their mm -hmm. environment. And remarkably, these people have very low incidence of disease. They don't live very long because they're living in an extreme environment. Right. They might live to 40 or so. But, it's but they don't get diabetes. It's because they don't of get accidents, cancer. Right. Hmm? But they die because of accidents. Accidents, yeah, right, infections. Right. You know, they right. don't have modern medicine. Right. Right. But they're not dying from diabetes. Right. They're not dying from cancer. Right. Uh, they're not d dying from metabolic disorders that are linked to our, to our diet and our gut function. I mean, can we say they're... So so they have their human genome, but the, the microbiome also has its own yes. genome. So it's a combined genome. So That's they have right. a bigger genome than what we have. Yeah. Is so that the case? Yeah. People right. look at, well, collectively. Collectively, the right. whole They call it a holo-genome. Right. Is, is uh, much more than the sum of its parts. Right. And in, you know, in science, we often think of these as the textbook examples of symbiosis. Mm -hmm. and, and when I was being trained as an undergraduate, you know, coral reefs were the, corals were the, the epitome of symbiotic associations, but now it's like symbiosis is everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's inside of us. It's inside of, it's right. inside of ourselves right. too. Right. So this sort of pairing of these genetic libraries is is almost a universal right. trait in life. And if in some of the craziest examples of symbiosis occur within the dinoflagellates, because they can have a symbiont themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have diatoms that are symbionts, mm -hmm. and some of the diatoms. So have bacteria deeper, that right, are symbionts, right. right? So it's a symbiosis when it's, it's like a Russian doll. Right. You know, right. Symbiosis, yeah. It's amazing. I mean, so how can, how can we combine a, a library with another species to create a symbiotic relationship? Well, I, the, the first, the most important thing is that the, um, the genetic code is universal to all life forms. Uh -huh. So we're all speaking the same language. So you're saying on a molecular level we could? We can. One day. We do. Regularly. We do. Yeah. Okay. And even within our guts, um, you know, things we worry about like antimicrobial resistance. Right. Uh, those are genetic factors. And the most cutting edge research shows that we can do whatever we can to try to attack the microbes that mm -hmm. have those genes, but they quickly share them with other microbes in right. the gut. Right. So it's almost getting to the point where m I myself wonder what is the fundamental unit of life. Mm -hmm. And we used to think that it's a cell right. or that it's an organism, right. but now it really s looks like it's genes. Mm -hmm. that, that the genes are the, the fundamental well, units. I mean the selfish gene book. Yeah, it's, it's linked to that. Right. But we call them transposable elements or horizontal gene transfer. Right. At the microbial level, DNA is just being traded like a commodity. But I mean, more on more on transcendent level. So, so what's the meaning of saturating the planet with this tremendous information? Like, like, do you wonder as a scientist? Like, you, because you, now you see, you know, you just see that, you know, after we talk, you know, I think, oh, I'm just sitting here like trillions and multiplied by billions of data, right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying the whole biosphere is just incredible amount of data, right? right. What's the meaning of? this data then? What is the meaning of the data? This is where you're going to run into my <laughs> bullheaded no, I mean, scientific I mean, do, do mind. You, do, you, do you wonder like when you go diving and or when you, when you look at the <laughs> when you look at the symbiotic relationship mm -hmm. and uh, do you see a meaning do you see or, or yeah has ever 
come to your mind? Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, you're, you're asking the ultimate question, right? Why, why we're here and what <laughs> <laughs> how do we get here and all that stuff. But do you see, I mean, do, do you now when you go dive, you see them as data? Well, or were you you were still more concerned? I, mean, I guess you know, as you know, as you, it's like the you know, when, when I go dive, I'm still looking at colors and shapes. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I'm attracted to the movement. You know, so I'm still attracted to these things rather yeah. than seeing them as data. But you know, after we talk, I start to feel really like the the matrix image. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. yeah, it's true in some ways, but um, I don't know. I mean, if you're, it, I'm not a spiritual person. Um, so I often think about things um, uh, from that perspective, and um, you know. So when people ask me what's the meaning of life, I mean, I would I would probably answer that life is the meaning of life. You know, um, there's no other complicated answer for that. And the whole reason that we're here is to advance that that information forward. It, yeah, on that on that point, has the there was a question over here. Sorry. Yeah, just following up. Yeah. On sorry. Saying. Yeah. moment in, in uh, thinking about uh, uh, the science. Mm. But for him, the way he sort of described it was diversity, this kind of yeah. um, proliferation of diversity was his way of sort of giving an image to what is happening. Right. Um, but that doesn't seem to obtain now. Because, you know, very often, you know, we're, we're all very gloomy at the moment, you know, climate change and, you know, all those kinds of uh, extinction, mm -hmm. but what you're suggesting is that, you know, I mean, many, many years ago, I read an essay that crystallized for me uh, the idea of extinction. Uh, you know, it's weeds, rats, and pigeons will thrive, will yeah. die, mm. and lions and tigers will be gone, and polar bears and all that stuff, but we'll still have plenty of life. Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, our image of diversity is at attached to the, the you know, like uh, charismatic mega f uh, flora and, yeah. and fauna, but we don't think of diversity in this way. Mm -hmm. So this is another way of really thinking about diversity, and it's less, uh, it's less of a human scale, perhaps, but it still is a, a massive proliferation. Yeah. That's sort of the scientific question. So the, the you know, we're talking about extinction, so yeah. the, the genes also... We lose the genes, yeah. right? But mm -hmm. but I see you're saying one is they can still be we can still find them in these archaeological sure. sites I mean even after extinction. We we all have a little sliver of Neanderthal DNA, right? That we now know about. Right. But also people I've read, you know, one person is saying we are also creating speciation. You mm -hmm. know, we are also creating situations where we have more species now in urban well. environments, like the, these plants. Uh, they they migrate and then they they they, then they become hybrid, but in sort of the m the the bigger picture, do we have more information now, or are we really losing information as we get into mass extinction? I don't know the real answer to that, but I think that um, diversity is the is the output of speciation minus extinction, right? And uh, we know that we are in a period of mass extinction. Um, and it's very likely that, I mean, people are calling this the, the Anthropocene, which is the era of man. The, the sixth extinction. And the sixth uh, great extinction. So that implies that the rate of extinction is now exceeding the rate of speciation. So the, the ultimate outcome of that would be a loss so of we're genetic information. information right, yeah. In that sense. Mm -hmm. And this is what this is why people are fearful of extinction from mm -hmm. a very pragmatic standpoint, mm -hmm. because we know that some of these organisms hold the keys to our health and well-being. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, corals and other marine organisms are targets for um, looking for anti-cancer drugs, mm -hmm. um, and when they go extinct, we lose the ability to even understand if they ever had that. Uh, that information, right? Mm -hmm. So we lose that knowledge forever. Mm -hmm. So there are practical reasons why we should be concerned about the loss of biodiversity and wor being worried about ourselves seems, mm -hmm. seems to be an effective uh, way of framing right. it. Yeah, selfish yeah. reasons. Yeah. But um, yeah, so there's a great deal to lose uh, in pharmacology um, and also in, the, in what we call ecosystem functioning. So I'm leading now a, a big project here in uh, Hong Kong where mm -hmm. we're trying to census marine life here in a way that's never been done before. 
and that's using the, m the most advanced DNA sequencing technologies. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as we kind of talked about before, you were talking about, well, well I, do you look at things differently when you go diving? You know, right. the things that you can see, right. uh, I'm limited to what I can see with my eyes. But most of life is sm so small that you can't see it with your eyes. Um, for example, when if we go out and collect um, organisms in Hong Kong, we might be lucky to, s to count 100 different species in a small space. But with DNA tools, we can sequence everything that's there. And we know that there are thousands, there are thousands of species in a small space. Um, and that's a remarkable thing. So now we're trying to, to do this very high level modern uh, census of marine life here and with with these molecular tools we can also we can also quantify what genes are present in the environment and what those genes might be doing like nutrient cycling like removing toxins and heavy metals and things th these are services that we value as human beings we would like to have clean water and a lot of times clean water comes about because of the the yeah, functional genome that's out I mean, there. I, I often think we're, we're only just starting to understand there's so, so much information, but to understand what the each code is doing will just take, you know, another maybe thousands of years of research, uh, no? I don't think so, no? because now we have something called big data analytics. Okay. Um, and s especially if with human-related diseases, right. there's there are massive databases that are being compiled. Yeah, but we're not investigating their code, right? We're only looking at their code if we consider it's useful to humans. Yeah, but right. we can, so I have a colleague um, who, he, he's just kind of entertaining my environmental slant, but he's, a, he's basically a medical biologist. Mm -hmm. And all of his students, they're, they're all coders, right? They just sit here and code all day long. I think it's terribly boring. And their codes are meant to mine databases. So they go into these databases of the human genome, and they are able to scan our, the, the genome, and they're able to identify uh, targets for drug therapies. And they can cross-reference that with databases for diets, for example, what people are eating. And then they can identify, well, these certain foods either have a positive or negative effect on the drug's performance in the human genome. So they can also use that to mine the database of, of course. Like dinoflagellate if, yeah. you, if, you, if you sequence them. If I had enough money, of course. Um, but, but right now, a lot, most of the funding is for understanding human health and well-being. Mm -hmm. So part of my agenda is try to link the two together. So if I can prove to you that bacteria in the harbor are protecting us somehow from the spread of disease, then maybe you're, you're more likely to be concerned about the preservation of You know how we mine the data in HR archive? Mm. Is people like her, like coming here yeah, to, yeah. <laughs> to mine the data. No, I'm just, you know, I think, you know, there's still, um, uh, you know, we're kind of having this discussion because I think, you know, there's some similarities, but, you know, there's also a huge barrier between disciplines. We, we're, we're not even thinking about, you know, mining data that way yet, mm. I guess, here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, actually, t should we ask you, Michelle and Michael, to join the discussion? Sure. D Can you I, I mean, the, the bathroom is, th should we just, d do people need keys to the bathroom? If uh, they need yes, to we go do to have the keys in the back. Yeah, if so if like you need to go to, go to, to the, the bathroom, bathroom, you can take the keys and go to the bathroom. And then we'll have a little bit more discussion. We'll, should we, should you sure, come sit I here? Can also. And um, Michael? Yeah. Can I stay here? I'm close to you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. With Michael, Michelle. Okay. Michelle, yeah. yeah. And also, I mean, any any comments? Um, so now it's more of an open discussion. Um, but maybe we'll show it later if we have time. Yeah. So we just keep it going. Yeah. I think the, the first thing that comes to my mind is actually related to an article I recently read uh, in the New Yorker. It's the the last issue of the November. Um, series, but anyhow, uh, it's about how we, I mean, that barrier that you're talking about, the science and the humanities, but in relation to how museums and how libraries can think about their collections. Um, so, for instance, if we are looking at a historical document, and let's take the, the example of one of the manuscripts that Kepler wrote in the, the 17th century, you know, Kepler, the, the astronomer and the mathematician, the, the very famous person. So when we look at the, the historical document or the manuscript, we would only see what he wrote about 
let's say, the, the planetary motions or how he also thought about that the, the Earth, um, you know, sweated or even farted like humans. You know, these are the things that we can read from the, the manuscripts. But this recent study is the, the study of extracting proteins from these manuscripts because you know, obviously it's there is the, the saliva, there is the, the sweat uh, that people, that the scientists can extract. And right now they are studying and they are thinking about or they are analyzing this data to understand the diet of this person, you know, what this person was eating or uh, was this person using metals or, you know, using drugs or medication. So right now uh, there is this argument that um, Kepler himself was an alchemist and a lot of people now are refuting that argument. But right now with the, the combination of these two fields, I think there is another way that we can think about those things. I mean, this also, the, the, the New Yorker article was saying that this particular scientist uh, recently signed an agreement with the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. So I think they're going to do a similar research on the artworks that they have. So, so next year for AA's grant, someone will apply to do, look into the diet of Chinese performance artists in <laughs> 1980s, right? And then come look at the documents. Well, you can ask them what, <laughs> or, but, but you know, there's the Da Zhang who died, right, for example, right? Yeah. But, um, but that's, that's, that's looking at proteins rather than genomes. Yeah. Right? There's no trace of DNA yeah. on the paper. Yeah, right? the, the only thing that the article was saying that the genomes, they are relatively stable, more stable, whereas the, the proteins, it, they change all the time. I mean, if we are asleep, we produce different type of proteins. So if we are taking medication, we are producing different types of proteins. And that I think that's the, the diversity that are, they're also looking at uh, in these historical documents and artworks from centuries ago. Um, the other thing I kind of want to talk about and also just to, to take advantage of people here, you know, uh, we, so I raised the question, you know, we produce knowledge in universities, you know, in archive, we produce knowledge. Um, but what I feel today often, uh, I didn't show the slide, so, I, you know, when I work with plants, people come see the artwork, you know, if for example, when we went to the garden, people look at the plants, they are fascinated by the plants, they ask, what can I use this plant for? And then I'll tell them, you know, for example, uh, uh, the, the chicken shit vine that if you have stomach problem, you can eat it. So people always ask, but I realize now, when after they learn about this factoid, this no piece of knowledge, very few people will act on it, right? So now knowledge has become kind of thing we accumulate. Um, so kind of like commodity we, commu we accumulate, but we actually don't use. So the question, you know, so I started to raise the question whether we overproduce knowledge and whether we should also think about composting knowledge. So that's why I asked Michael to come because Michael does composting um, with, maybe, maybe you can just explain, for people who don't know composting, maybe you just explain a little bit. I, I prepared some slides yeah. uh, which talk about perhaps my approach to composting in like a more community-based way and even the concept of radical composting in different sites of uh, like uh, of occupation um, but yeah I guess okay sure yeah I'll just go through sorry and then I'll come back to you I'll ask you like how so it's yeah my sharing is a bit more <laughs> anecdotal and I'm actually reusing some <laughs> illustrations uh, that I made a, a few years ago in relation to composting so I had to also I, I'm very informal with my composting um, I know it's a very important not to throw like fruit skins and eggshells into the bin because they eventually, well, they'll go to landfill and that will create methane and contribute to climate change. But I also feel that climate change isn't up to the individual. It's up to like corporations and the government to really, uh, yeah, re reduce it significantly. Um, I was in Korea the other day and they co the government collects like each household's food waste, which was really nice to see. <laughs> um, but yeah, I live in like <laughs> A neighborhood with loads of um, like restaurants and alleyways like 
turn into like their own little like composting zones every night and you could like smell it <laughs> like one block away um so yeah uh in terms of like carbon and nitrogen uh here are some compostables um the ratio should really be like 30 percent uh, carb uh, sorry 30 uh, ratio is 30 to 1 uh, carbon to nitrogen uh, and the carbon includes like um like brown material such as like egg cartons um sawdust uh paper so in terms of yeah so i always think the aa library has a lot of carbon yeah, we can yeah. use for composting sorry so like the office office paper like the shredding machine uh not necessarily glossy paper because they have like maybe material uh metal content but yeah like using the yeah the office paper uh for composting and then also the nitrogen um using like green matter uh food waste like some of the stuff you've seen here and also yeah just share like some approaches that we've tried in the past uh, this was in the, on our rooftop in Altal Gok, um, where we would collect food waste from a uh, vegetable wholesaler in Yalmate. And uh, luckily, we had like a, a wood studio on the second floor, and there was loads of sawdust. So we would, I mean, we never really measured the quantity and the ratio. <laughs> we were like really informal about it, but you can see how we processed it. And uh, this is a group that I met through perhaps the first permaculture class in Hong Kong in Ma Po Po Community Farm. And you could see it's a very communal and labor intensive process. Um, I wrote about this like in the past and I kind of called it like the dim sum composting where you have to wrap it in a banner and turn it with like several people and then uh, yeah, smash it to smaller pieces so it could break down much quicker. And uh, although I spent most of my time in like Mong Kok during the umbrella movement, I was really happy to see composting happening in outside the government headquarters. This was just outside the Lennon Wall. And uh, yeah, some urban farmers were really active and they wanted to diversify the movement and not just focus on universal suffrage, but to talk about agricultural policy. So this idea of like radical composting and taking composting away from uh, the kitchen sink to uh, <laughs> yeah, places of occupation, I think is, uh, yeah, really, really, uh, yeah, intriguing for me. And I even remember when I was uh, in New York at the time in 2011 um, at um, Sukati Park, Occupy Wall Street, they were also having some stormwater, um, like, uh, what is it, bio biofilter system, and they were also yeah using the food waste there to compost their plants as well, and uh, yeah, this was a, a composting box that we <laughs> we um uh, got made at Spring Workshop uh, in 2014, 15. Seems like a long time ago, and so this was kind of more of a artistic approach to composting. Uh, we made a very big container. Uh, it's probably to scale actually. Yeah. So you can see that the box is pretty big. And uh, yeah, this was like how it worked. We done like the lasagna uh, method of composting. And uh, yeah, over time, the plants actually broke out of the composting box. And we were growing, I think, a, like a pumpkin vine, but it never fruited, but maybe it was just like h highly like oh nourished. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. But it was really long. Like um, we had an event where we laid out the vine and yeah it was like yeah like at least yeah five meters i think and this idea of compost tea so having a liquid form of composting uh that that compost box also yeah had a a tap at the bottom and we would dil dilute that i think it's like a ratio of like one to ten ten being water and uh yeah feeding the plants directly with this tea um so yeah more kind of i guess neighborhood composting initiatives uh we practice at our market store in yalmate and we actually over over we can over produce <laughs> compost uh because of the fruit and vegetable markets nearby and yeah you could see that there's this is huge bin here which we practice more kind of like worm composting um so uh we we wouldn't do the dim sum kind of turn over and then wrap it back again we would uh yeah f like put loads of worms inside to um produce yeah the nutritious soil and that would be taken to a gorilla 
a homeless gorilla farmer called Mango King who was living nearby. And he also practiced like a really interesting uh, method of composting where he used his own human waste um, and urine. Um, but I know Marcus is here in the, in the background, who's um, yeah really uh, <laughs> passionate and uh, yeah um, knowledgeable about using uh, human urine for composting. So maybe he could do some sharing later. So I have yeah. A is, it, is it better to, to recycle paper or is it better to compost paper? Do you know? Uh, yeah, there. Are, uh, paper is carbon. Yeah, yeah. You know, because we, when we compost, we do need carbon and the poop. Mm. And, you know, where I live, I get carbon from dry leaves. But for people who don't have dry leaves, can they just use paper? Yeah, yeah, they can. Um, because we're, like, friends with some, I guess, grandmas that recycle cardboard, mm -hmm. I would naturally just give them my, my paper and card. Um, but, yeah, like... Uh, yeah, we would probably use dry leaves more than paper. Uh, paper. Normally, yes. Yeah, yeah right. because yeah. I guess that paper is right. for someone else's survival, right. so it, it makes sense to, to share it in that way. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the reason I ask about paper is, you know, I wonder from the, scienti fr from the scientific perspective, the, the DNAs when the when animal dies or when the plant dies, they uh, get decomposed, so the DNA information evaporates, right? Is that the case? Yeah. Uh, one of the most abundant enzymes that our cells produce is called RNase. And RNase breaks down RNA because our cells are making RNA all the time. RNA is what's turned into the protein. Um, so, in fact, when we do RNA work in my laboratory, we have to decontaminate the lab of RNase um, because otherwise it will break down the things that we're trying to measure. So, so in, a, in a way, we That's right, and I, I would say even within our cells, there's composting of, of DNA because uh, oftentimes we produce things in excess of what we need, or oftentimes our responses are not um, linear. So, for example, your cells don't really know what they're doing, right? They're not conscious um, at, at an individual level. So they're just responding to environmental stimuli, or they're s responding to a hormone that's being secreted by your brain. And so that might increase the level of, of expression of a certain gene. But that is not going to do anything unless it crosses a certain threshold. threshold. And so while s there are all kinds of triggers that would increase the expression of that gene, there's all kinds of factors that are suppressing it at the same time. So everything that's happening in the cell is the consequence of this sort of tug of war, right? Of between expression and, and really composting of, of those molecular right. signals. Yeah. Right. So I'm I'm you know, because I, I just imagine when I compose a book, the carbon just gonna get some <laughs> So the book just, you know, the, the information on the page just gets evaporated mm. when the book decomposes. But when now when we have the hard drive at Facebook, you know, the hard drive breaks down, they, they destroy the actual hard drive. They don't reuse it, right? Because they, want, they, they say it's for data protection. Um, so they, they don't reuse that material. But in, in DNA, RNA, can do cells re-decompose and then reuse that material to yeah. reassemble the information? The nucleotides will be conserved, right. So the nucleotides can be dismantled from the DNA strand and then can be used to construct new ones. Um, yeah, so I mean, actually the analogy to composting is really appropriate. Um, and, you, and I would say to your comment about recycling paper versus composting paper, well, there's probably a strong argument to be made that composting is better for an energy savings reasons, right? We're, you know, we're kind of also at the same, right now, opening our eyes to some of the problems with recycling, aren't we? Yeah, because the energy consumption in recycling is really, really high. Um, but if we let nature do its thing, which is really happen, that's the ecosystem functioning I was talking about, that decomposition process is, is mediated by microorganisms that are using their libraries 
their DNA libraries to conduct that process in a very in energy and efficient way. So, yeah. So the, I mean, the, the question I have, I don't even have the answer. I mean, it may not also be you, um, but just just to everyone, if anyone has any idea, you know, I keep thinking about how, w what does it mean to compost knowledge? You know, when we assemble something into knowledge, how do we decompose it? So, but it can also goes into the cycle of knowledge rather than just evaporates. So that's the question I keep imagine. That's the question I have in my mind. I just don't have the answer. I wonder if I mean any any scientific metaphor or thing that you can draw, or from maybe from the actual composting. Well, any, anyone have any comment? Yes, go ahead. Now that the microphone is back. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a question for David from a while back. Um, it might have something, it, it's, uh, I guess, a parallel sort of thinking d uh, with environmental systems, which is also quite closely related to sort of how one archives, or it's a closed system, or it's also in, in organisms, is how do they deal with entropy and heat? Because when, when you have a process that has feedback, positive, negative, that regulates itself, what actually gets produced is entropy, but chaos, but if, but if and heat. Low, if, but if they use very low energy, you know, if we saw early on, if they use so little energy to encode and decode, so I assume it doesn't heat up. You know, it's our, f it's our way of doing the server farm. That's yeah. very hot. In fact, we have the opposite problem, right? So for, for mammals, we're warming our bodies so that we optimize all those processes so that we can function no matter what the outdoor temperature is. Um, so yeah, I agree. It's uh, the, 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 the energetics of, of decoding our library and using that knowledge to function um, is so energy efficient that we don't have that buildup of, of heat energy, which is really waste, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um. Oscar, you also have talked about fermentation of, of information. So when you think about composting and fermentation, I don't know if you have any comment there. Good one. <laughs> um, one of the, the reasons why the, the idea or the metaphor of fermentation came about is we had this conversation with uh, a curator and educator from Istanbul, Vasif Korten, uh, who's also part of the, the same series who owns it, um, that's related to Tubal's residency. And um, it was perhaps not directly related to, to knowledge itself, but it was mostly about the potential of art institutions. Um, if I can speak just a couple of minutes about that. Uh, the, the question that he was asking was, um, we constantly think about arts organizations or museums as these open places. You know, we have exhibitions, we have libraries, we have archives, and all of these things are supposed to be open all the time, so that there's always a sense of publicness that's related to that. But he was asking, what is the, the potential of these places out, you know, um, beyond their exhibitionary output or beyond the, the visible output that they put um, on the table? And the, the idea of fermentation comes at the moment when he imagines these places, be it archives or museums or places like AAA, what happens if it provides a space that's very safe and that's very isolated? So it's like pickling, right? Uh, you can put a lid on the, on the jar and then you can just wait for it and then with the time, the transformation is going to happen. It destroys certain things, but it also creates something different. Um, and he was also saying that, you know, it might take a couple of years if you want to make a good miso. But for pickling just cucumber, it might take a couple of days. So things demand their own time. And perhaps arts organizations that we always think about as this big examples of openness, they can also provide that space that's safe for people, for mostly civic conversations. So it was really about the idea of how arts organizations are able to create a sense of publicness. Um, so it's might, it not, might be not dire directly related to, to knowledge itself, but maybe you know, the, the bigger value that um, art spaces might produce. But I don't know, maybe you, know, you might uh, want to respond I mean, to it that. It just triggers something I've been listening to recently. So um, I wonder if that has anything to do on the genetic level. Um, so 
saying a lot of the organism, the living organisms actually really organize them as swarms. So they don't have a hierarchical structure to order like us. You know, we have this brain that my sort of m uh, manages our functions. But in the roots of trees, uh, so this is the, 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 the thing I learned recently, when you look at the roots of trees, the epitome, right? The, 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 the head of the roots, the tip of the roots, they all individually kind of make decisions where to go and then they coordinate that the, the tree lives well, but if you look at each tip of the root, you know, they're not really receiving waters from a centralized um, brain. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's, it's this very, you know, they're saying it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the roots of the trees, it's also in, you know, bees most people understand already, but also maybe in cells, I don't know, in genes. So there's, you know, there's a lot of sort of a swarm democratic activity rather than a hierarchical uh, situation in living yeah. organisms. I have a colleague that studies biofilms, and he, he's particularly interested in the, the bacteria that accumulate in our drinking water lines. Um, because biofilms are a perfect example of this. Um, and they, they call it, uh, the mechanism they call is, qu is quorum oh, sensing, yes. quorum sensing. So what that means is that when you have a quorum, like you have a certain threshold of a number of cells uh, in the area together, they suddenly start working together to, towards a common goal. And I mean, these are microbes, right? These are bacteria, so they don't have nerve cells or anything like that. Um, but they can coordinate themselves so that they produce secondary structures or certain c compounds that will protect them and also ensure that they have the right environment to reproduce and, and proliferate. Um, yeah, so v very, very similar analogy, I think. There was a question back there. Okay, so uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Baker. So um, when you talk about the biodiversity, so you're talking about quotation mark nature. So in Hong Kong context would be AFCD, right? And uh, yes, and but when it goes to all those um, gorilla urbanism, tactical urbanism, or what's happening here in urban farming and residual spaces, that the Anthropocene or the human beings are manipulating the environment and creating a whole set of environment, yeah. that somehow adaptation happens. And some ecologists would talk about Anthropocene and also talk about Norfolk ecosystem. So when it goes back to the data accumulation, so we, we, are, we are start, start getting to know what's happening in the nature, but when it goes to the ob urban context, are these novel ecosystem totally negative or it actually creates something? Because apart from the urban farming, most plants there would be quotation mark exotic, quotation mark invasive in a sense, or weeks in a sense, which to me is a uh, like a uh, subjective to a sense or from a moral level we think they're not good but are they actually objectively or scientifically creating something new to us or not? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well first I mean uh, at a philosophical level I'm not one to extract humanity from an ecosystem right so I think that we are a part of the ecosystem we're just happen to be incredibly efficient at devastating the natural states of ecosystems. But um, on one level, we are, so diversity, first of all, is, uh, is directly proportional to what we would call an ecological niche um, space. And an ecological niche is just defines whatever micro environment, temperature, humidity, um, all these other conditions, soil quality, whatever. Um, that allows a species to be successful, right? So species evolve to occupy ecological niche space. And so we know that in um, the most diverse environments are diverse because they have a very high diversity of that physical space or the variation of that physical space. Uh, a practical example from Hong Kong is that um, in Tolo Harbor, which is historically and continues to be uh, a very polluted place, um, we've created this incredible gradient of pollution. So in, from the Sha Tin area, from the Xingmen River, all the way through Tolo Channel, the, 
the, the water quality goes from really, really awful to pretty good. Uh, and then you can go all the way out to Tungping Chow, um, which is a beautiful place if you've not visited. And we have coral reefs, right? And this is all changing over the course of 10 kilometers. Uh, we know that in Tolo Harbor, probably 1,000 or 3,000 years ago, there was coral reefs everywhere. But now we've changed it entirely. Now, what is the consequence of that? Have we lost diversity? I would argue that actually we haven't uh, because we still have Tung Ping Chao with, with the pristine coral reef. And now in between, we've created all these new ecological niche spaces, right? Now, it's just that those spaces might not be fostering the type of species that we desire, okay? So we're talking about microbes, for example. We're talking about organisms that live in, the, in a primordial soup of, you know, noxious, anoxic conditions. Um, we don't value that, mostly because we can't eat it. But those, <laughs> but those things are doing really important things for us, right? They're detoxifying the water, for example. They're removing pollution. Uh, they're composting, in a way, for us. Um, and so if we took them away, because we don't value them, then we would be left with a bigger environmental problem. But the, the, I think the worry is we're going to we're gonna lose Dong Ping Zhou, we're gonna lose all the corals, and we end up only living with these detoxicating yeah, yeah. Um, organisms. And that's, that's, a that, that's a dystopic picture that we're yeah. getting into. Right, and that's what we need to avoid at all costs. We need to avoid the, the total loss of biodiversity, um, because we know that 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 will certainly lead to a decline in our, not only our economic benefits from the environment, but also eventually our own health and well-being. Yeah. I think we have like, Can, it's um, gonna start. The, sorry, it, like. It, I'll it, try it, to do this before the drilling starts. No, I'll just say <laughs> something if, like in case, it's, so the drilling might start in one minute. <laughs> uh, so uh, if it does, we'll, we'll stop, but yeah. yes. Um, I just uh, wanted to bring in something that I received from another artist friend who I've been having very long years of conversations about archiving and the waste and things that we don't desire in perhaps an archive. And one of these things is a silver fish. A silver fish. You know, if you have books, the little thing that eats the book. Um, but this is something that my friend Xie Lan Tian, um, and I'll just read this from an email that I, I got uh, day before. Uh, thinking about our conversation on silverfish, thinking silverfish as a technique, it's a metaphor, to think archive conversation history, a formulation, digestion as an operating logic of contemporaneity of the time of now, and time as material that is uniquely edible. Thinking silverfish as hungry protagonists leading a revolt against time as hegemonic stomach. And you know, there are some thoughts on uh, digestion. Yeah, so thinking of what if an artist uh, is not only just a keeper of history, but is a nibbler and chewer of his contemporary. What has been nibbled is not left in ruin, but is digested in so far as digestion has some organizing principle or some shape-shifting possibility, some aptitude to movement, or some transformation of material, some energy. Um, so it comes out of a place of hunger, of curiosity. And then thinking about a house, an archive, and this is my interpretation, a group of people, a stomach, and all of us as enzymes helping to digest, marinate, and ferment. Yeah. I think we should just end here. It's <laughs> perfect. Thank yeah. you, Lee. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Yes. <laughs>